um, in person on Zoom. We are excited to have you and um, to host uh, Dr. Cortina today. I'll just remind you that um, we are in our 41st year of the ethics lecture series and um, this year's series is on gender equity. And um, we're really excited to have a number of amazing speakers, including Dr. Cortina. We um, will have three speakers in December. Um, this week obviously is live and also on Zoom. Um, next week also will be live here in P117 with Dr. Julie Silver from Harvard. And then the last one in December, the Wednesday after that, on December 14th um, will be uh, Dr. Melissa Gilliam, who was a former University of Chicago um, faculty and ob and um, is now um, at Ohio State. So we'll be looking forward to hearing from her. Um, but let me go ahead and introduce, uh, and I should just say that we will be monitoring the chat for questions, and I will be asking those questions of Dr. Cortina live at the end. Um, so if you have anything on Zoom, please ask it in the chat. And then, of course, in the room, you can ask in person. But let me introduce um, Dr. Cortina. So Dr. Cortina is a University of Diversity and Social Transformation Professor of Psychology, um, Women and Gender Studies, and Management Organizations at the University of Michigan. She's an organizational psychologist and investigates workplace experiences of harassment and incivility. To date, Dr. Cortina has published over 100 scientific works on these topics. This research has won awards, but its impact stretches beyond the walls of the academy. For instance, Cortina is regularly called to serve as an expert witness, translating findings from social science to inform policy and legal decision making. She recently joined colleagues in co-authoring a landmark report on sexual harassment for the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, and I know she'll be sharing from, uh, from that today. So welcome, Dr. Cortina. All right, thanks so much for that nice introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you here today and share some of my work on um, sexual harassment in organizations. Um, I've been studying this topic for 25 years, um, more specifically so that we can advance our understanding of as sexual harassment and figure out how to remove it as a barrier to gender equity in organizations. Um, so what I'm gonna do with my talk today is basically share some key findings findings from that body of science um, as summarized in this 2018 report uh, released by the, published by the National Academies, as, as Julie mentioned. Um, just briefly, to give you an idea of what to expect, I will talk about some of the key findings from that report. Um, it started with some very basic questions. You know, what is sexual harassment from a scientific perspective? How are people harmed by this behavior and what should we do about it? Um, and then I'll spend a bit of time talking about some new developments that have come out of that big report, including uh, new legislation and a big multi-institutional collaboration, which UChicago is part of. Um, and then there should be plenty of time at the end for um, Q&A. All right, let me start by stating the obvious. Um, sexual harassment is not a new problem. Uh, it's not a new area of study for scientific inquiry. Uh, psychologists and sociologists have been studying sexual harassment since the early 1980s. Um, but that research has largely escaped the notice of folks in science, technology, engineering, medical fields. Um, but the National Academies came in and they changed that. So, um, in case you're not familiar, the, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine is a private nonprofit organization. Um, that's a mouthful of a name, so people often call it the National Academies or NASM. And NASM is not part of the federal government, but it was founded by the federal government in 1863, I believe, uh, to advise the nation on matters having to do with science, technology, engineering, medicine. And the National Academies uh, releases various kinds of products, uh, a big one being their, their consensus study reports. And these are reports written by committees of experts that reflect the consensus on uh, the state of knowledge about a particular topic. And they've released reports on a whole host of different topics. This is just a small sampling. Um, and in 2016, they commissioned a report, a consensus study report on 
the sexual harassment of women. So I served on the consensus study panel that, that wrote this report, and our charge was specifically to review the research record on the sexual harassment of women, specifically in science, engineering, and medical careers, um, and also identify best practices for the prevention of sexual harassment. Um, and let me note that the research that we covered in this report actually cuts across a lot of different fields and departments and industries. It's actually not limited to STEM or academic medicine or even higher education, um, since the research record is, is broader than those fields. Um, it's a 300 page report, so I can't really do it justice today. Um, I will just give you a glimpse into the kind of things that it covers. So it starts with some very basic questions. You know, what is this thing we call sexual harassment? Um, how common is this conduct in our organizations today? Um, so uh, we used Jennifer Berdahl's definition. She's a social psychologist at UBC uh, and defined sexual harassment as conduct that derogates, demeans, or humiliates people based on their sex or gender. Um, and that's... a uh, uh, a, a big umbrella definition, uh, the field recognizes several different subtypes of sexual harassment. Um, some of those subtypes involve uh, sexual come-ons, if you will. So that includes sexual coercion, um, which refers to you know, making conditions of employment or education contingent upon sexual cooperation. Um, should I admit this person? No, someone else is doing it. Okay, cool, <laughs> thanks. Um, so sexual, coer sexual coercion would be the sort of sleep with me or you're fired situation, right? Um, it's often the first thing that comes to people's minds when they hear the term sexual harassment, but it's actually the rarest form that this behavior takes. A little bit more common uh, is unwanted sexual attention, which is exactly what it sounds like. Unwanted touching, hugging, stroking, repeated requests for dates or sexual behavior despite discouragement. And unwanted sexual attention sometimes does include sexual assault. So these are behaviors that fall into the come on category. There's another whole set of behaviors that are more like put downs um, and that's gender harassment. And gender harassment has nothing to do with sexual pursuit or trying to pull people into sexual relationship. Uh, relationships. Instead, it's more about pushing people away or even pushing them out of the institution. So sometimes gender harassment is purely sexist, you know, saying women can't cut it in surgery or men don't belong in nursing. Um, other times, gender harassment is more crude and lewd. Um, for example, hearing comments that, you know, women are uh, dumb sluts taking jobs away from better qualified men. Um, if you hear if you hear remarks like like that like that in the workplace, or, you know in in this setting it can be pretty shocking. Um, you know, imagine how shocking it would be to hear that coming from one of your coworkers, um, from a supervisor, from a student. So gender harassment is um, not about sex. It's not about sexual conquest. Instead, it's about contempt. But the all of these different behaviors are all forms of sexual harassment. In other words, sex-based harassment in organizations, and they're all deeply problematic. So um, just to give you an idea of how common these different behaviors are, I pulled a few findings from just a couple of organizations that I've studied. Um, we see very similar patterns across different types of organizations. Um, of the subtypes of sexual harassment, Gender, gender harassment is always the most common form that we see across industries, across institutions. Um, again, just to illustrate, these are data from a, a large public university in the Midwest, not the University of Michigan, but it's a place a lot like Michigan. Um, and this graph shows you the percent of female and uh, females faculty and staff who have encountered some kind of sexually harassing conduct in the past two years on the job. Um, and a few things to notice about this. So 37% of the women said they had not seen any kind of harassment in the last two years. And these are answering questions, not questions like, have you been sexually harassed or have you been gender harassed? It's asking, you know, have you encountered specific behaviors? You know, how often has someone touched you in a way that made you feel uncomfortable would be unwanted sexual attention. 
So 37, so it's a long list of behaviors. 37% said, no, haven't seen any of that. Okay, that's the big slice of the pie, the big white slice on the left. But that means that 63% of the women had been sexually harassed in some way. Okay, that's more than six out of every 10 female faculty and staff at this large university. And most of the time, gender harassment was involved in some way. So every slice of the pie in some shade of blue includes gender harassment. Um, again, these are data from a single institution, but every institution I've ever studied has had similar kinds of trends. And generally speaking, the more male dominated the context or the male, male, more male dominated the industry, then the higher the rates of sexual harassment. All right, so the National Academies commissioned an interview study during the um, development of our report um, where they conducted interviews with women uh, faculty in science, engineering, and medicine to better understand experiences of sexual harassment in those spaces. And this quote illustrates uh, examples of gender harassment. Uh, it's an assistant professor of engineering who writes about uh, demeaning the woman, shutting her up in the workplace, demeaning her in front of other colleagues, telling her she's not as capable as others are. It's not just, you know, touching or making sexual advances. It's more at the intellectual level. They try to mentally play those mind games so that you won't be able to perform. Okay, so most of what she's talking about here is a put down, not a come on. Okay, so these are experiences of higher ed from the perspective of faculty and staff. What about the perspective of students? Um, here are findings from another large public university system, this one in the Southwest, um, and it's based on surveys of students. And in this study, again, you see that gender harassment is the most common form that sexual harassment takes, especially students in medicine. Okay, um, let me, again, I'll walk you through what to, what to notice here. So for this analysis- um, that's okay. Oh. <laughs> Are you able to mute them? Okay. Um, so this for this analysis, we broke down findings depending on the student's field of study. So you have uh, data for students pursuing degrees in the sciences, engineering, medicine, and then fields outside of STEM. Um, several things to notice here. There are no differences across fields in experiences of unwanted sexual attention. Those are the small sort of greenish turquoise bars. I don't know if you could see the colors that well in this room, but uh, it ranges from 3%, 4%, 2%. So two to 4% of women students have encountered some kind of unwanted sexual coercion. And this is specifically asking about behavior from faculty or staff. Okay, faculty or staff perpetrated behaviors. So two to 4%. And there's no difference across fields. There's also no difference across fields in rates of sexual coercion, which are the very small orange bars. Okay, 1% across fields, no differences. Um, now, let me be clear. 2 to 4% is a rate that is 2 to 4% too high. 1% is a rate that is 1% too high. Okay, no student should have to put up with any of this kind of abuse in return for the right to receive an education. Another thing that is striking here are the very high rates of gender harassment, particularly sexist gender harassment, which is in the navy blue bar, um, and particularly in medicine. So medical students report significantly more gender harassment than students in other fields. Um, so what is that about? Um, this is always a question that people ask. I would love to hear perspectives from um, people in the room or people on the Zoom about how to make sense of this. Um, but again, uh, returning to the findings from the interview study, um, medical training settings like residencies were described as breeding grounds for abuse. Um, medical students came to expect hostile, grueling conditions in training. And again, the interviews were with people who uh, uh, acknowledged having been harassed in some way. So it might have been a glimpse into the more harassing kind of medical training settings, but the survey was just a survey of students broadly across that institution in the Southwest. Um, 
So the students in, in med school came to see sort of sexual harassment as just part of this continuum of awfulness that they'd have to put up with at that point in their career. So a few quotes from the interviews, uh, one wrote or one reported, the thing about residency training is everyone is having human rights violations. So it's just like tolerable sexual harassment. And then this woman uh, said, I reported to my program director, the chief resident, and then the site director, who told me that maybe if I stopped whining so much, I would have more friends. So they basically blew off the report. So this last example is an example of um, a department or a site, a training site that didn't take sexual harassment seriously, didn't take the reports of harassment seriously. And that kind of non-response and minimization of sexual harassment reports um, are, is shown according to research that that really kind of contributes to the ongoing nature of sexual harassment, that there are these systems built to not only prevent it, but also respond and um, put an end to it when it begins. And when those systems don't respond appropriately, then it continues. All right, so again, these are probably some of the most hostile medical training ses uh, settings in the country. Not every setting is like this, um, but these are some examples of uh, places where things have gone awry. All right, let's see. Why isn't it advancing? There we go. All right, so another um, thing that's clear from the research record is that sexual harassment is a complex phenomenon. Um, it intersects with racism, uh, homophobia, transphobia, and other discriminatory mindsets. So what that means is that lesbian and bisexual women, women of color, and trans women end up getting uh, harassed at significantly higher rates than their straight, white, cisgender counterparts. Um, so the harms are even more concentrated on women uh, uh, from marginalized groups. So one question that often comes up um, is uh, when, when we're talking about the report is what about men? So the National Academies report, the charge was to focus on the experiences of women. Uh, so it didn't take up this particular question, but there is research literature that speaks to it. Um, so can't men be sexually harassed? Yes, they can, but it doesn't fit what most people or pe many people are often picturing. More often than not, the harasser is another man engaging in what we refer to as not man enough harassment. So it's one man belittling or, or berating a male colleague or a male subordinate um, for engaging in what's seen as sort of stereotypically feminine activity. Um, helping out uh, around the house, uh, taking time off of work to look after uh, a child, um, expressing vulnerability or so-called weak emotions, being too sensitive, too small, too gay, or in some other way, not living up to the ideals of traditional heterosexual masculinity. So yes, men do get sexually harassed, but it doesn't fit what, what a common stereotype is about that. All right, so one way to think about sexual harassment is a sort of iceberg. So unwanted sexual attention, sexual coercion, and sexual assault are at the top. Uh, so these are the behaviors that break through to public view, that make it into the news, um, that are widely recognized as impermissible sexual harassment. Those are also the behaviors that tend to make it into our trainings, um, uh, policies, procedures, so forth, in higher education and in the private sector for that matter. Um, but the research record is clear. More often than not, sexual harassment is a put down, not a come on. So the bulk of the iceberg reflects examples of gender harassment, okay? So behaviors that demean, um, that derogate, that humiliate people, that put them down based on their sex or gender. And gender harassment is submerged in the image because many people don't realize that gender harassment is a form of sexual harassment in the sense of being sex-based harassment. Um, and it definitely is. All right, so what do we make of these behaviors? A lot of what we're talking about are put-downs. A lot of what we're talking about are verbal insults, sometimes visual gestures, that sort of thing. Um, so are people are really harmed by these behaviors? 
So a lot of research has looked at this question from different perspectives and found that sexual harassment does take a toll on work and well-being. So as sexual harassment goes up in a particular setting, we generally find that people working or trying to learn in that setting are less satisfied with it, less committed to it. They experience more conflict and less cohesion within their teams if there's sexual harassment in the team. Uh, they report more stress and burnout and uh, symptoms of anxiety and depression, substance abuse. And then if the sexual harassment continues day in, day out, then you start to see uh, uh, physical symptoms of chronic stress. And these kinds of outcomes emerge even when the harassment solely consists of gender harassment. So when the sexual harassment entails nothing but sexist insult, even without any kind of unwanted sexual pursuit, it takes a toll on the people who are targeted with it. So a, a meta-analysis came out a few years ago that really drives this point home um, very compellingly. So this was an analysis that combined data from 88 studies based on surveys of over 70,000 women. And the big conclusion of this analysis is that gender harassment has a similar impact, if not a greater impact on outcomes compared to unwanted sexual attention and sexual coercion. So this is a graph of a few of the effect sizes from the paper, and it kind of illustrates uh, the, the differences in the relationships across the subtypes of harassment. Um, just to walk you through a few things to notice here. Um, so the light blue bars show you the magnitude of the correlations between sexual coercion and these different outcomes um, related to self-reported physical health and satisfaction with different aspects of the job. And the effect sizes for sexual coercion, again, in light blue, are on the smaller side. Effects for gender harassment are in yellow, and they're significantly larger, okay? So for example, look at job satisfaction. So it's the outcome at the very bottom. Um, the effect size for gender harassment is nearly twice the effect size for sexual coercion. So that's a finding that surprises a lot of people. Um, it flies in the face of popular wisdom. So how do we make sense of findings like that? So the authors do a nice job in their paper explaining this. And they write that sexual coercion and unwanted sexual attention are traumatic for the people involved and more likely to result in court cases and public reporting. However, in many work settings, these intense experiences are low frequency events. Okay, they don't happen that often. The more frequent, less intense and often unchallenged gender harassment appears at least as detrimental for women's well-being. It should not be considered a lesser form of sexism. And another thing to point out here is that one need not be directly targeted with sexual harassment to feel its negative effects. So one metaphor that's sometimes used is the idea of secondhand smoke. You know, that it's a it's something that, ex, uh, that anyone else sharing the same environment can experience harms from being in, in that environment. Um, so the harms of sexual harassment spreads to um, spread to witnesses, work groups, teams, um, de entire departments even. And people leave because of it. Okay, so when women are sexually harassed, they leave. Their coworkers leave. Even the men leave. They don't want to stick around and watch their valued colleague be demeaned and disparaged, and they don't want to become uh, the next target themselves. So all faculty, staff, and students, uh, female and otherwise, uh, suffer from spending time in environments that are degrading or humiliating or misogynistic. All right, so given all the horrible findings, <laughs> the big question is always, what do we do about this problem? What do we do about sexual harassment? And uh, what could we do, be doing better and how can we prevent it? Um, so the National Academies report goes into this question in great detail. Um, what works, what doesn't, and what should we be doing differently, specifically in um, uh, science, engineering, and academic medicine, but more broadly in higher ed. So, Sometimes people wonder, you know, should men stop meeting privately with junior women? 
women trainees, women students? Um, and my answer to that question is always an emphatic no. Um, uh, the mentoring, including one-on-one -on -one mentoring, one-on-one -on -one training, um, happens in these kinds of one-on-one -on -one meetings in a lot of fields. Um, and it's important to advancement in those fields. It's, it's absolutely vital in some industries. So in some organizations and industries, you do not get ahead without that kind of individualized attention. Um, so the, the private meetings are actually important meetings in a lot of ways, in a lot of uh, uh, contexts. Um, also, this question is sort of, you know, behind it is is a myth. It's it's the idea that, um, you know, you better not meet alone. You better keep the door open because she might accuse you of something you didn't do. Um, whether people are saying it, this is kind of this lingering idea that's out there. Um, and it's the, the, it's the myth that women commonly fabricate or exaggerate claims of sexual victimization. Um, and, and there's absolutely. There's no basis for this myth. There's no, the research has looked into different, that's in different ways and there's, there's really no basis for it. What we do find is that formal accusations of any kind of sexual victimization are, are rare and false accusations are even rarer. Uh, men are more likely to be sexually harassed by other men than they are to be falsely accused by a woman. Um, that said, maybe a male faculty member doesn't want to meet privately with um, women students, doesn't want to mentor women, doesn't want to admit women uh, to his lab. That's fine. That's his prerogative. But in that case, he can't meet privately with men students. He can't mentor men students. He can't admit men to his lab. Okay. Otherwise, he'd be breaking the law. So it's a blatant violation of sex discrimination law to offer training and opportunities to members of one sex and not the other. So we don't generally recommend that we address one form of sex discrimination like sexual harassment with another form. So uh, my answer to this is always no. So what about reporting systems? Should we build bigger and better reporting systems should we improve the training so that everyone knows how to use them and everyone knows where to go to make a report and then sit back and wait for victims to file in with their complaints? So this is what institutions have been trying for decades and this is what hasn't really worked, okay? Um, we have seen, especially in the last uh, 20 years, a lot of, of organizations really beef up their, their reporting mechanisms. Um, but we haven't seen this massive influx or this, this big reduction, I should say, in harassment. So just to illustrate again, here are two findings from a, a findings from two different studies and two different contexts and time periods. So on the left, you see data from uh, 1996. These are data from employees who've been sexually harassed at a large public university. And among those, these are only the harassed people. And among them, only 4% filed a formal complaint about it. So relatively low rate of reporting. Fast forward the clock 20 years, the date on the right are 2016. These are graduate employees of a large organization. And among those who've been sexually harassed, a little over 6% filed a formal complaint about it. Okay, so reporting is extremely rare. And that's true in general of different kinds of wrongdoing and grievances and crimes. People generally uh, don't necessarily want to engage with formal reporting mechanisms. And there are a lot of people, a lot of reasons people don't want to report um, sexual harassment, particularly when it's a colleague, a coworker, a boss. Um, uh, they're, they're worried about uh, retaliation not being believed, inaction, shame, blame, um, damage to their career or their future in income prospects. And unfortunately, the research shows that these fears are, real, are well founded. So reporting mechanisms are absolutely necessary. They do do important things for our institutions, um, but they're altogether sufficient, excuse me, insufficient. They will not fix the problem of sexual harassment. Uh, we need to do a lot more than um, uh, put in place formal reporting. So if you look at the research record, actually, you find you don't see a lot of evidence that the interventions that are now common throughout higher ed 
have had much impact in terms of actually reducing sexually harassing conduct. So uh, one of the big um, points that the National Academies report makes is that we need to think outside the box if we want to move the needle on this. So we need to think about um, policies and trainings and interventions um, that uh, look like that, that move beyond formal reporting as, as the end all be all solution. And that look beyond um, only looking, only focusing on sexually aggressive acts of abuse. So many intervention systems and response systems are really focusing on the most sexually aggressive um, acts of harassment and abuse. Those acts simply don't happen without a firm foundation of disrespect. Um, so we need to overhaul the institutional cultures that allow that disrespect to thrive um, and think about how to, how to cultivate a culture of respect. So then the big question is how exactly do you do that? How do you cultivate this climate of respect? So there's another whole research literature on workplace incivility, workplace bullying, workplace undermining, different terms for different kinds of hostile behaviors that don't have to do with sex or gender. But that um, literature has a lot of ideas for how to improve respect and civility um, in the workplace, which also applies for educational settings. Just to give you a, just a few examples, of, of the kinds of recommendations that come out of that literature. Um, we should be making respect a part of um, hiring criteria, performance evaluation criteria, promotion and tenure criteria, um, and really taking um, respectful or inclusive behavior seriously um, for the, the, the you know, hiring, evaluation, promotion of people at all levels of our institutions. We can also scrutinize everyday practices. So um, is, is our department a place where uh, people routinely uh, yell at staff or students? Um, is it common for women to be interrupted in meetings? Or does the department have a star culture where some people are above the rules because they're just so brilliant or so famous or they bring in so many grant dollars? So it might be time to, to rethink some of those norms. We can also take around, uh, take a look at the built environment of the institution. So who's celebrated in photographs, in statues, and portraits, and who is missing? So universities and academic medical centers are covered with walls of white men. And I didn't know I'd be in this room to give this talk, but here's an example right here. This is very, very common. I've never visited an academic medical center that doesn't have walls like this. Um, this image in the slide is my own department of psychology at the University of Michigan, and that's our dude wall. So some folks think the walls don't really matter, but I would argue that they send a powerful message about who belongs, who's valued, and who is not. So the walls might be a good place to start if we want to start making our departments and our settings, our classrooms, so on, um, more respectful and more inclusive. All right, so this is a 300 page report that I just distilled down to a short, sweet 35 minutes. There's a lot more in the report. I, If you're interested in, in more detail, you can download the whole report for free from the website. You can order a hard copy. It can be read in and chapters are written as a standalone modules. So if you're really only interested in the, the legal frameworks around sexual harassment, you can read that chapter. If you really want to know more about intervention uh, ideas, read chapter six, so on and so forth. It's very accessible. Um, so to date, the report's estimated to have reached about 30 million people on social media, um, over 3 billion people through news reports. Um, it's change the conversation around sexual harassment. So people um, are now understanding sexual harassment as not just a women's issue or just a gender issue, but rather as a science issue, a medicine issue, a training issue, um, a problem that really derails work and education in these fields and drives people out of the fields. So the reports also prompted sweeping change and changes in policies and practices throughout higher education. 
and it's made its way into five proposed pieces of legislation, one of which was recently signed into law. So how many of you have heard of the CHIPS Act? Certainly some people have. CHIPS Act was all over the news about two months ago. Okay, um, the full name is the CHIPS and Science Act of uh, 2022. Um, and it's mostly known for its superconductor investments, right? So if you read that news, you would, you would, you would be seeing uh, news about it. But the science piece includes a section on sexual harassment in science, um, or rather prevention and response to sexual harassment in the broader scientific workforce. So that section of the bill started out as the Combating Sexual Harassment in Science Act, which was introduced in the House by uh, Eddie Bernice Johnson and introduced in the Senate by then Senator Kamala Harris. That was folded into the CHIPS Act, which Joe Biden signed into law two months ago. So the new law cites the National Academy's report extensively um, and implements various recommendations from the report. So for example, it directs the NSF to fund sexual harassment research. Um, if anyone's interested in doing work on these topics, um, I think different federal agencies will be offering more funding to, to, for new studies and new interventions. Um, the act also directs the NSF and the NAS to create new standards of conduct, and it steers research dollars away from known harassers. So principal investigators found to have committed, uh, committed egregious sexual harassment were never at risk of losing their federal funding until the CHIPS Act. And the act allocates uh, $32.5 million to, to fund this new work. Um, and that's in some respects kind of small potatoes. The larger act authorizes some $174 billion, um, but this funding is drawing more attention to sexual harassment. Um, it's making it more likely that people are gonna take it seriously. It's enabling more research and action, including action in fields, like I said at the outset of my talk, that were formerly not really paying much attention to sexual harassment. All right, a second big thing that's come out of the report is an action collaborative on preventing sexual harassment in higher education. Um, so an action collaborative is simply a coalition of the willing. Um, it's people who come together to work on a system-wide problem and develop innovative solutions. So this action collaborative was uh, formed and it's supported by the National Academies. And today it includes 55 institutions, including University of Chicago. Um, and each institution makes a commitment of time and money and effort to uh, develop new approaches to addressing sexual harassment, um, implement uh, uh, and test new programs, policies, and practices every year, and share information publicly about these efforts. And then, so they share it with the National Academies and then the National Academies shares it with the world. And so the, the resources are shared through several different mechanisms. One are, uh, there's, a, there's a meeting, a summit that happens every fall, every fall convened by the National Academies, um, where it's different member institutions presenting about what they're trying and what's working on their campus. Uh, videos and materials are then made available to the public after the meeting. Um, there's an annual report that summarizes the accomplishments of that particular year, um, and it highlights work that's been shared by the member institutions. There is a rubric which basically lists topic areas aligned with the 2018 report, and it's basically a tool that organizations can use to track kind of where they're doing work or where they might want to start doing work. And then one thing that I love is an online repository of work. Um, so this is uh, descriptions from the mem member institutions of uh, actions that are especially novel and significant and, and innovative that they're taking on. And there's lots of examples of descriptions of practices in this repository. So this is a publicly available archive. You don't need to subscribe. You don't need to be a member of the Action Collaborative. Anyone can go to the website and access it. It describes significant policies, 
procedures, programs, so on and so forth. And the descriptions are categorized into 25-ish areas. Um, this is just a few of them right here. So you can search on whatever topic that you are trying to develop programming in, you know, civility or respect, um, for example, or leadership education. And then it pulls up all the descriptions from mem member in institutions that fall into that bucket. And just to give you a few examples, I'm not gonna read through all these, but these are the kinds of, of uh, work that are described in this digital online repository. So uh, descriptions from different institutions that are doing new things in terms of reference checks to identify people who have been found to have committed harassment at their former institution and are trying to move institutions. Historically, personnel policies and records and whatnot are private and the institution that we're applying to can't access them. So these are novel uh, policies that make it legally uh, possible to do this kind of sharing of records across institutions. Um, different toolkits for leaders, um, different programs around anonymous reporting, um, programs and, uh, that are setting up ombuds offices to give people avenues to confidential advice, um, non-mandatory sort of reporting resources. Um, different institutions addressing, addressing gender harassing behavior, reducing power differentials, increasing transparency, so on and so forth. Using climate surveys, a lot of campuses are putting in place or conducting some kind of survey to gauge what's going on and figure out how to respond to it. Um, and these are different institutions talking about the nuts and bolts of how they're doing that. Um, I'm happy to share this slide, uh, the slide, the, the slides afterwards. All of these links are live. You can click on them and go see what's in the repository but you can just go to the National Academy's website and you'll find the Action Collaborative rep Repository pretty easily if you're interested. So the Action Collaborative work um, uh, is divided into these, these working groups, these topic areas that the, that the National Academy staff supports, um, organized around prevention, response, evaluation, and remediation. Um, and they work on, um, gathering and summarizing the relevant research, um, identifying promising practices and so forth. And they've put out some papers in the last few years, um, which again, these are available to anybody who's interested in downloading them. Um, the first paper, again, all about climate surveys and how to construct the best climate surveys using the latest, greatest science of survey methods to assess sexual harassment prevalence. Um, two papers on these reference tech checking policies that I was mentioning, you know, uh, accessing personal personnel records to stop passing the harasser. Um, a paper on uh, sexual harassment policies and processes through a procedural justice lens. And uh, you, so using that kind of framework to make them uh, so that they, be, they become their experiences more fair from the people and from the stakeholders in that space. And then a paper on sanctions and early interventions for faculty sexual harassment. Um, again, these papers are all available for download. The Action Collaborative is all about sharing out resources to, um, to, to create change in the larger higher education space, um, including not just universities, but also national labs, for example, including academic medical centers. All right. One final set of questions that I want to leave y'all with, and then I'm happy to take your questions. So sexual harassment policies, um, procedures, um, penalties for those who harass have been uh, focused heavily on unwanted sexual pursuit and sexual coercion. But that's literally only taking aim at the tip of the iceberg. Um, again, it's a focus that is absolutely necessary, but not sufficient. So what are we doing here? Um, remember that more often than not, sexual harassment is a put down, not a come on. So what are we doing to address um, the slights and indignities that combine to relegate women to the margins of, of, of organizational life? Um, uh, how can we transform our in, 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 institutional cultures to be more respectful, uh, more inclusive, to treat all people with dignity, no matter their sex, race, uh, gender, sexuality, 
or other social identity. So if we can begin to answer questions like those, then we might need we might start really moving the needle in the and reducing sexual harassment. All right, with that, I will take a pause and I'll be happy to take your questions. first question and then happy to take questions from the room. Um, also, you can type it in the chat and I can read them out. I was really um, struck by the, one of the earlier graphs where um, like a third of people said they were had gender harassment, but a third of people said they had no harassment. And I, um, my experience as a leader is that I used to answer, no, I've never been harassed when I took a climate survey or culture survey. And the more I've learned about sexual harassment with lectures like these is like, oh, actually, in my training in you know early years, I probably did experience harassment, but I always answered no, because I was not sexually coerced at any time. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I just wonder if you could just comment on that. How what's the understanding of the perception of how many people actually answer no, but maybe have experienced it, but don't understand exactly what they're being asked? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about how we how we measure it in studies like that. Um, so it's an inventory, like I said, it's a long list of behaviors um, and none of them use the term sexual harassment. So it'll have questions like, um, how often in the past two years or the past year, have you heard sexist comments by one of your coworkers or supervisors, heard sexually offensive jokes, um, someone made a, a obscene remark about women or you saw a vulgar gesture. Some of the items I think, you know, they cover so much territory that I just think, how could you not have encountered all of that or not all of that, some of that at one point. Um, but I think the, the terms and that instrument include like sexist comments. And I think not everyone considers what I might consider sexist, someone else might not. Um, so more recent iterations of that measure, we've removed language like that that might be less clear. Um, so that's that's one thought, but another thought is that so we ask all these these questions, and typically the answer is like yes, I've experienced this once or twice. Sometimes, you know, it's usually not every day, but you know, occasionally. And then at the very end, there's just one broad question: Have you been sexually harassed? It was originally like a criterion item, and people will say yes, yes, yes. Oh no, I've never been sexually harassed. Um, so that speaks to your point that a lot of people experience these and they're they're so normalized in some settings that they, they don't even experience it as a problem. Um, so research that's looked at, you know, whether you label the behavior. So have calling it sexual harassment, we, we think of that as a labeling kind of item. Um, there have been studies of, uh, you know, personal and professional satisfaction, well-being and so forth. And does that differ between people who are harassed and they label it harassment or they're harassed and they don't attach the label and there's actually no difference. Um, so regardless of how we think about our experiences, they they seem to have sort of an impact. Okay, I have a few questions from the back here. Um, so one is Dr. Wooster in nephrology. Is this an example of the 80, 2080 rule where a small number of people are responsible for the majority of all harassment episodes? Um, did the same people harass men and women? That's an interesting question. So a lot of studies, they we, we have not gotten, there, there's been less perpetrator research, I should say, first of all. So studies of sexual harassment from the perspective of perpetrators than the perspective of targets. Um, and when the targets are reporting on the behaviors or sometimes we'll ask them, you know, who done it, so to speak, you know, a person and what was their gender, what was their position, what was their power level, for example. And we don't know whether they're all talking about the same bad apple or the same few bad apples or whether there's a, a bunch of bad actors. Um, that said, there was a study that the New York Times commissioned a few years back where they use some of the standard instruments from social sciences. And it's usually a study of, you know, have you been, you know, been targeted with these behaviors? And they flipped it around and they asked men, have you engaged in these behaviors? Um, and especially gender harassment, there were shockingly high rates of gender harassment. And it wasn't, 
these are not framed as like, here's a study of sexual harassment. Because if you frame it in that way, people will say, no, I've never done any of these things because I wouldn't be a harasser. But if you frame it as, have you told an off-color joke in the workplace, um, said lewd or crude things or whatnot, it was surprising how many men in an anonymous survey, so on and so forth, said yes, that they had done that. Any, any comments in the room before I answer the Zoom question? I don't want, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Really uh, uh, enjoyed hearing about it, although it's certainly not happy mm -hmm. to hear about it. Um, so what I'm curious about is in this context of um, clearly the more men, the more there tends to be an issue. And so I wonder if you, whether you have any sense of um, the data with respect to different areas of medicine. Mm. And so certainly some areas, surgery, one example, mm -hmm. is much more male dominated than mm. other areas. And some subspecialty surgery is much more so than mm. others. Um, and so, so is it that there, you know, is this a greater problem in those that have greater percentages from men? Or is it a problem that's related to the extent to which it is a hierarchical or not hierarchical structure mm. of the practice? Oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so if I'm hearing what you're saying, the specialties within medicine, there's sort of a, there's a confound of male dominated in terms of, you know, who's, who's, on, who's there, but also the hierarchy, is it a tall hierarchy? Is hierarchy, is it a strong one versus some are flatter? Yes. But, oh, that's so interesting. Um, we did do a study of this, a survey with Reshma Jagsi, who I think was here a few weeks ago, um, and surveyed uh, faculty and uh, students pursuing medical degrees at the University of Michigan. And we looked at, we couldn't do individual specialties because we were worried that people wouldn't want to divulge exactly, you know, they're very small, like they, they wouldn't want to be identifiable. Um, but we had collections of specialties like work with women and children, kind of, I think was one of the big buckets. Um, and I don't remember exactly what our findings are. Um, we published it. I'm happy to share the paper or pull the paper up. Um, but I do remember that it, did not fit any of the stereotypes. It wasn't that surgery is by far the worst and pediatrics is the best. Um, it might have been, I wanna say there was a finding that anesthesiology had less patient perpetrated harassment, which kind of made sense if, <laughs> if the patients are asleep. Yeah, um, it was a study that also separated out harassment from patients and patients' families versus coworkers, um, supervisors, and so, so forth. Um, and, and I think the, the hope of our medical school was, well, a lot of this behavior must be coming from the public. It's the patients, it's the families and whatnot. And sure, they were doing some of it, but a lot of it was coming from within the institution. Okay, Dr. Aurora, who's joining us on Zoom. Um, thank you so much for being with us. I was curious if you could break, if you could discuss how to break through the inertia and silence when such things occur. Oh, that's a great question. Um, Dr. Aurora, by the way, who is on the leadership board of the Action Collaborative, so she's very involved in this work. Um, how to break through the silence. So one of the projects I'm working on right now is actually to address that exact question. Um, and we have uh, thought about silence around sexual harassment as being kind of more multi-layered and more complicated than what's often thought about. So silence in terms of not just a victim doesn't want to come forward, but also um, victims do come forward often, you know, formally and informally, and then they get silenced. Um, or they actually are discouraged from filing a report or when they do their report falls in deaf ears. So the, they, they, they do speak up and nobody hears them. And some of the biggest cases that have hit the news have involved people. It took multiple women coming forward multiple times over the course of years for action to actually um, happen. Um, so one thing that we're doing in this project is trying to figure out 
what are the antecedents for those those kinds of networks of silence to build? Um, and how do we intervene in those in, in, in those uh, antecedents so that it's less likely to lead to those silences? And this project is still in the very early stages. It's, it's more theoretical at this point. So we don't have the answers yet, um, but I think it's a really important question to ask. And I do think we've made progress in the sense of, you know, people are talking about sexual harassment, you know, uh, lecture series like this are including, you know, multiple speakers doing work on sexual harassment. So there's more attention to it, um, more awareness, you know, a new bill that's addressing it, so on and so forth. Um, so I think there's progress, but I mean, to her point, there's a lot of um, a lot of work that we still need to do there. I'm going to um, wrap up this part with this last question from Dr. Landon. Um, thanks so much for a wonderful talk. This is so important for all of us. In my experience, there's not a good way to provide feedback regarding bad meeting behavior, like talking over a woman, interrupting women, idea stealing, et cetera. I find such feedback often gets framed as overreaction or is blown off. What are best practices for preventing these behaviors in the first place and or successfully addressing and changing them? I will say in my role as leadership, people come to me. I was like, can you give feedback to this person? And uh, it's a yeah. funny, it's a funny, like whose role is it to like mm -hmm. give that feedback? Yeah, that's a great question. So whose job is it to set the climate, to cultivate the climate of respect? And I agree, people often look to the leader, the department chair, the the department head, you know, and, put, and suggest that you know it's their job to fix the climate of the of the unit. Um, I try to emphasize that it's everyone's job, um, and it's not because the person that you know running the unit can't necessarily intervene in the day to day interactions. So the. The most effective program I've seen um, to actually change norms of disrespect to respect or incivility to, to, to civility is a program that it's, it's, there's an acronym, CRU, uh, civ Civility, Respect, and Engagement in the Workplace, I think is what it stands for. And it was a respectful workplace program, basically, in um, hospital settings where the the intervention involved some kind of trainers or facilitators coming in. You know, the, the institution had to want to do this, but the uh, the groups, the work groups or teams that were part of the study um, received some kind of a toolkit and they met with the facilitator and the teams met every two weeks, I think for six months and talked about, you know, here are our standards, here are the behavioral the ideals that we want to meet. Here's what's respectful, disrespectful. Um, and so it's very uh, grassroots, not like the, the dean telling them here's what's respectful and whatnot. Um, and then they'd meet again every uh, two, two weeks later and you know reassess how are we doing. So in this example, if one of the things that's considered disrespectful is interrupting in meetings, then that would be discussed. And then the group would talk about, well, what do we do when this happens? Oh, okay, well, so-and-so should say something or everyone should stop, whatever the intervention is. So they decide what makes sense for their particular unit, their particular team. But they would meet every two weeks, uh, reassess, reflect back on what's going on. Um, and this crew intervention has been tested through some kind of randomized trials. I don't remember the details, but they, they did see changes um, that after six months of these, so it's a pretty intensive, I, I don't even wanna call it training because it's a, a series of, of, of meetings. Um, they did see a change in terms of the people's perceptions of respect, um, levels of burnout, intentions to stay with that uh, institution, so on and so forth. So I, I don't think there's one answer to this question about what to, what to do about problematic meeting behavior, um, but there are some ideas and interventions like that about how kind of it can be ground up and and, and grassroots and involves involves everybody, like not just the person at the top. Well, thank you so much. Um, one last round of applause for a great talk and and hearing with our hybrid meeting. So thank you so much. Um, 
we'll go ahead and stop the recording and then I think we're going to have a discussion with the ethics fellows um but yeah thank you so much yeah pleasure I'll stop this I'm just other